about um, kinds of tongues, kinds of tongues. And by the end of this class, you're going to understand some of the different <laughs> uses of tongues. The only one I've ever heard teach on this is Brother Kenneth Hagin. And uh, so let's read the text, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 12. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. And this word here is uninformed. It, it doesn't mean stupid. It means you just don't haven't been informed. You know that you were Gentiles or pagan or heathen, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Now, if you can picture in your mind back in that time, there was all kinds of temples to all kinds of different gods. Mercury, Jupiter, uh, Zeus, uh, Medusa, all of them. They all, and they believed that these gods were real. They believed that these gods were real. And so they'd go to these temples and they would they yield to demons. And so they were led by demon spirits. And he said, you know, when you were in these pagan temples, you were carried away to these dumb idols. Dumb, not meaning ignorant, but dumb meaning they can't speak. Mm -hmm. However, you were led. So they were being led by something. It was by demons. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. No one's going to be anointed to say that. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It takes the Holy Spirit to, for you to even realize that. Mm -hmm. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. I want you to circle the word all in all. Notice it's God that's doing the work. Y'all see that? These gifts of the Spirit is God working. But where is he working all of these? In all of us. God does his work in and through his body. If the work's going to be done, it's going to be done through his body. Okay, so oftentimes, you know, we're praying, Oh God, God oh God, please move. And God, yeah, I wish you would. Okay, I wish you would let me move. Because I'm depending on you yielding to me. All right, so it's God who's working. These gifts of the Spirit is God working in and through all of us. Amen. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So if we're not letting the Holy Spirit manifest, we're not experiencing supernatural profit, are we? No. And notice that they're not called gifts. They're called the manifestation. Some are gifts, some are ministries, some are activities, but they're all manifestations. I want you to... I want you to really underline the phrase manifestation of the Spirit. Manifestation. So these nine list, listed here are how the Holy Spirit manifests himself. What I'm taking away from this is that the Holy Spirit wants to manifest himself. He wants to show up, but he can't do it without us. All right? He wants to manifest himself. And here are the nine. For the one, here's the first one, is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge, through the same Spirit, to another faith, I like to say special faith, by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings, by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, and you want to put an S after that, it's, it's workings of miracles. No one has the gift of working of miracles. There are workings of miracles. The manifestation will come, the miracle is worked, the manifestation is over. All right? There's different workings of miracles. Okay? I'm not teaching on gifts right now, so I don't want to get too far into that. But it's, it's, it just says it's gifts of healings, it's workings of miracles to another prophecy, to another, again, discernings of spirits. No one has the gift of discerning of spirits. It's discernings. It means it's, there's multiple, multiple manifestations. We want to be available to all nine. And whatever's needed, that's what we want to yield to. Right. Okay. Uh, and the, here it is, to another different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues, but the one and the same spirit works. Works The spirit works all these things. Distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one, so also is Christ. So Christ is made up of people operating in the manifestations of the Spirit. You know the difference between a social club and the body of Christ? The body of Christ is manifesting Christ. Yeah. A social club gets together and talks about a book called the Bible. Yeah. All 
all right, or whatever. Our church, us, us church, and our church, and all that. But the body of Christ is Christ manifested <clears throat> through his body. We are the manifestation of Christ. Yes. Now, here it says, uh, discern or different kinds of tongues, kinds of tongues. Now, in the outline, in the, in the uh, diverse kinds of tongues defined, diverse kinds of tongues are diverse. I prefer, really, you know, divers is an old English word, diverse mm -hmm. kinds of tongues. Is supernatural utterance by the Holy Spirit in languages never learned by the speaker. Never learned by the speaker. Not understanding, not understood by the mind of the speaker. Nor necessarily understood by the hearer. Now it can be, there's times the hearer will understand what you're saying. Right. Speaking with tongues has nothing whatsoever to do with linguistic ability. As some churches teach. It's the ability to learn a language so you can be a missionary. It's not natural, it's supernatural. Right. It has nothing to do with the mind or the intellect of a person. It is a vocal miracle. Every time you speak with tongues, you are participating in a miracle. I had a quick question. When sure. It, you, I know you were talking about workings and discernings. How do you, in your experiences, have you seen that people just sometimes are more open to receiving the same gift from the Spirit, and maybe that's why they get confused? And they do. Yeah, they think they the only get. It's a good question. So when we get into ministry gifts, which I didn't get into this year, <clears throat> ran out of time. When you have, when you're called into an office, there'll be certain of these gifts that'll operate more frequently, okay. and there's a different gift mix uh, that happens in that situation. Okay. Okay. So, um, but. But at the same time, um, we don't own a gift to the right. point that I own it. Right. We yield to it. Right. Now, I, but, but I want to be careful in, in answering that, Allison, because then if we're not careful, we become passive and we wait for the Holy Ghost to move on us. Mm -hmm. Some of these you can move intentionally. Right. Yes. Okay. Just like praying in tongues, right. you can intentionally operate in gifts of the Spirit. Right. So there's this passivity that I learned under Brother Hagen, not his fault, mine, right. then I found out you can step into these things, uh, many of these, at will. Sure. Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. All right. But some are going to have in their office, like a prophet, definitely has to have right. two of the three revelation gifts, right. plus to get the prophecy. Right. But it'll have a different anointing on it than just a normal, I don't mean that bad, I don't mean that normal, but the, the prophet carries a different anointing sure. in that office. All right, and the reason I say that is some people, because they become really good at prophesying, they'll take on the title of local prophet of that church, mm -hmm. and they'll wreak havoc right. because I'm the prophet. No, you just learned how to prophesy, and you need to be quiet and let some other people prophesy. Right. So that's why we want to avoid kind of that that whole nomenclature. Sure. Yeah, good question. All right. So number one, different kinds of tongues in First Corinthians twelve ten does not necessarily mean different languages. When you see the word kinds of tongues, you immediately think, well, maybe sometimes I'm praying in French or Hebrew or, or uh, Italian or whatever. It could mean that. But I think that because it says and to another different kinds, uh, it, it's mentioning two things there, not just kinds of tongues and not just different tongues, but different kinds. So tongues, uh, letter A, and I'll... I'll, I'll I'll elucidate on this. Tongues are the same in essence, but different in use and purpose. The gift of tongues has different uses and purposes. That's very good. Okay. So they sound the same in a sense, but there's different, there's different purposes for them. Does that make sense? Right. B, there is a private use of tongues. There's a private kind of a tongue. And there's a public use or a public kind of tongue. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so under a private use, tongues is a personal prayer language. And that'll be the majority of your, majority of it will be you praying privately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul said that. Praise Jesus. Okay, but there's also public use, yes. a public kind of tongue, a public type. And that comes under four headings. Number one, tongues as a public message that must be, 
usually be interpreted. And the reason I say usually is because sometimes a tongue is given and a person that knows that language hears that message in his own language. Right. Um, I was trying to find the old uh, audio Brother Hagen taught that one back, back in like 65 or 60. I couldn't find it, but he gave several examples way back in the day of people that spoke in tongues and somebody else heard it in their language. Okay. Um, number two, tongues as a ministry gift accompanied by interpretation. This is a person who's called into that ministry. It's like an office. There is an office of tongues and interpretation. Just like somebody's called the pastor, <coughs> somebody's called to be an evangelist, there is a ministry gift of tongues and interpretation. And the reason we're not seeing it is because no one's teaching on it. Yeah. All right? Including me. And it wasn't until the Lord said, I want you to teach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit that I even began to start stirring this back up in me and thinking, this is not being taught. Right. So we're being robbed of some things. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Tongues as an evangelistic sign that requires no interpretation. And, and I want to, you might want to put a dash out from that or parenthesis, could be interpreted. So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean it's always doesn't need an, a tongue as a sign can also be interpreted. Sometimes it's a sign and the person that in their language hears it, they're like, wow, that was amazing. But there's also tongues and interpretation can be a sign to an unbeliever. And it's funny how the secret friendly Church of America doesn't want tongues on Sunday because we don't want the believers offended. But yet God says it's a sign to the unbeliever. We've become so unbiblical in our worship. We're trying to protect the unbeliever from getting freaked out with something God says is a sign. I remember even, and I'm admitting, I'm admitting a weakness here, okay? I remember years ago, here, every time, you know, I was desperate. We usually got a visitor about once every two years. So when you got a new person in, you wanted to really not offend them, not offend them and freak them out. Every time they came, a tongue manifested. And I said, Lord, what, you know, why? We're trying to win them, not run them off. <laughs> and a few years later, I was reading this. He said, uh, well, he said it's a sign mm -hmm. to, the to the unbeliever. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to protect the unbeliever from that awful, mean Holy Spirit. <laughs> now, we can manifest those things in a way that turns people off. Because it's not in love and not decently and not in order. But it's, you know, we don't have to protect people from it anyway. Uh, tongues in a corporate worship or prayer meeting where we all know what's going on that does not always have to be interpreted. All right? Number two, tongues. Let's look at the first one. Tongues as a private prayer language, a private devotional gift. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, verses 2 and 4. We're going to look at, in the scriptures, examples of it being a private devotional gift because as uh, many of you have already had people protest about tongues and you will run into them. We don't want to argue the word, but you also want to be informed so you can help people. And uh, they'll say, well, now, it's all right. We believe in tongues as long as somebody's there to interpret it. <coughs> well, you're only referring to the public side. Mm -hmm. What about in my private life? I don't need to interpret it. I don't have to have somebody there to interpret. All right. These were some of the hurdles I had to overcome. Like, oh, man, I can't pray in tongues unless somebody's there to interpret. You know, I was in college. I was 20 years old. I had to figure it out. But so, and number four, so here's the personal use. For he, verse 2, he who speaks in a tongue. Notice it doesn't say speak in tongues. It's singular. Right. Who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Wow. For no one understands him. However... In the Spirit, He speaks mysteries. Glory be to God. So you're talking to, to God, not to men. And uh, I want to point this out in verse 2. No one understands Him, including the one doing the speaking. Right? right? Verse 4. He who speaks in a tongue, singular, edif uh, edifies himself, charges himself up like a battery. But he who prophesies, obviously edifies the church. Then look at verse uh, 15 through 17, you see the private use again. No, I'm mistaken. That's not. That's public. That's a, that's a public use. Okay. What's happening in verses 15? Well, let's go back to 14. I might as well just explain this. 
When you read through 1 Corinthians 14, you've got to understand he's bouncing back and forth between the private use and the public use. And right now he's dealing with a person who is using his private language in a public meeting. He's, he's using his prayer tongue in a public meeting. Does that make sense? Okay. And what he's saying is if you're going to worship God with your prayer tongue in a public meeting, have enough love to interpret what you prayed so others can get in on it. Okay. Now, watch what he says. For if I pray, circle the word pray. Y'all see the word pray? Okay. And, and we'll get into this. Some of the uses of tongues is not prayer. It's a message. It's you. It's Tongues can go from God through you to people or from you to God. Tongues has two different directions, two different kinds. There are times God will inspire a person to give a message from God in tongues. That means it's flowing from God to the people. A prayer tongue is you talking to God. Right. Two different directions. But he says here, if you're in a public meeting and you're going that way and praying, you're praying in a tongue. He says, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So in a public meeting, what is the conclusion then? In a public meeting, I will pray with the spirit, my spirit, right? I will also pray, so we're still talking about prayer, with the understanding. In other words, I'm going to interpret it. I will sing with the spirit, and I'll, I will also sing with the understanding. I'll interpret my singing in English, if, if you're English speaking. Otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, uh, you're blessing God. How will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say, Amen? At your giving of thanks, so you're giving thanks, that's prayer, since he doesn't understand what you're saying. So you're doing this personal devotion in front of people, and he said, when you've got uninformed people around you, interpret what you prayed so they can get in on it. Right. Do you see how he's talking about you using your private prayer language in a public meeting? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, he said, for you indeed give thanks well. Wow, man, we ought to be praying a lot in tongues. We're yeah. giving thanks well. Yeah. Amen. But the other person's not edified. All right, so that's, again, a personal use in a public meeting. Verse 18 and 19, Paul's primary use of tongues was in his private life. You all know this. He said, I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than you all. Now, Corinth probably had fifty to 60,000 members in it. And they were excessively using tongues in their public meetings. And yet Paul's saying, I'm, I'm praying in tongues more than all of you all put together. That's a lot of that's a lot of tongue talking but he was also used to evangelize the known world most of it you know not China and all that but the, the Europe and all that Asia and he was used to write most of the New Testament so his praying in tongues paid off amen I remember Brother Hagin said this he said most of what I've learned from the Bible I've learned by praying in tongues while I read it he said 90% I heard him say it 90% of what I know about the Bible I got it by praying in tongues wow that's pretty cool. May I sure. Uh, somebody else also said that he said, if you'll pray in tongues two hours a day, not necessarily just locked up in your house, sure. just praying in tongues two hours a day, you'll find that you'll be in the right place at the right time, meeting the right people, you know, so doors true. opening or whatever, having wisdom. This is not quote, uh, not quoting that he said it just like that, but she said, well, I, I thought, well, that's really interesting. She said, but I was lazy. I only did it one hour a day. She said, but I still saw a lot go on in my life. That's awesome. If only I would have done it two hours two, a yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. I, I heard Brother Hagen say this as well. Um, I was sitting on the back of the platform behind him in this seminar. He said, um, <clears throat> all or most of my financial breakthroughs came after an extended time of praying in tongues. Almost all of my financial breakthroughs came after an extended time of praying in tongues. When Rhea got cancer, breast cancer, 2009, I would come here uh, six days a week, not Sunday, and pray one hour from six to seven in tongues. I didn't know what else to do. So I thought, I'm going to go give myself to this and pray in tongues one hour, six in the morning till seven in the morning, and I did that. Now, from 1990 until 2011, we barely made it financially here. We, we just barely make it. The church. Oh, yeah, the church. We lived from hand to mouth for 20, 
what's that, 21 years. But I prayed in tongues for over a year. Well, what else are you going to do, you know? For 21 years, we, we struggled. But I spent that year and a half praying in tongues uh, and in the Spirit. And all of a sudden, in 2012, it just changed in a matter of weeks. I mean, we would sometimes have a negative account, a negative bank account. One time, the secretary called me and said, there's no money to pay you. And uh, we were always, we were $30,000 in debt on our second mortgage and usually just barely making it. Within six months, we had $40,000 in the checking account and the $30,000 note paid off. Oh. We had that $70,000 in about six months. In a year's time, we had over $100,000 in the checking. In about two years' time, we had about $300,000 in the checking account. And it's never gone back. And it came from a season of praying in tongues an hour a day. I thought I was praying That's for real. I was just going to say. You, you thought yeah. you were praying for one thing. And you were. Probably. But more yeah. than that took place. You can get a lot done. Yes. So the grace of God, praying in tongues is a tremendous grace. It's a vocal miracle. And it works, man. Praise God. Okay. Now, uh, so he gave thanks. 1 Corinthians 14, 18, Paul's primary use, he said, uh, was verse 18. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all, yet in the church. So apparently he was referring to his personal time. But in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. So I, I like what Joseph Prince said one time. Paul prayed 10,000 words in a tongue, so his five words in church made a difference. <laughs> He said he prayed 10,000 words in private, so his five words made a difference. I tell you, we get a lot more done. If we pray much in tongues, it'll take a lot less in public. Our words become weighted with the power and glory of God. You become edified in the spirit. You could speak the truth from an unedified situation, and it still was the truth, but it didn't have power behind it. Right? You want your words to pack a punch? Back them up with 10,000 words in tongues. Amen. All right. Uh, then Romans 8, 26, it assists us in praying for the unknown. Romans 8, 26. Praise God. Thank God for the, for the Holy Spirit, right? Amen. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. You mean Christians have weaknesses? Apparently they do. What are our weaknesses? For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Right? You might have a general idea what to pray for, but not as you ought. Mm -hmm. You don't know everything the Holy Ghost knows. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And one of the arguments that you'll hear if you get online is, this is not talking about praying in tongues. This is talking about the Holy Spirit praying for you. No. P.C. Nelson, could he could write and read in 26 languages. He was an interpreter for the American government in World War II. He was also a Pentecostal pastor. Uh, and Brother Hagen knew Brother P.C. Nelson and he asked him, he was a Greek scholar he said, what does this mean? He said, it means that the Holy Spirit helps you to pray with groanings and sighings that are beyond your normal intelligent speech it's talking about praying in tongues have you ever been praying in the Spirit and kind of went <sighs> that's a sigh that's of the Spirit that's of the Spirit Amen. All right. Uh, so that's the private use. I could give several about that. Uh, tongues as a public message given that usually must be interpreted. 1 Corinthians 14, 5. Let's just look at the scriptures, right? Mm -hmm. Renew our mind on this. Mm -hmm. Paul said, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues unless... Indeed, he or she interprets that the church may receive edification. So tongues with interpretation is equal to prophecy. It edifies the church. Prophecy doesn't require tongues ahead of it. You're speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. You prophesy. When you speak with tongues in public, it's not going to help anybody unless it gets interpreted. And I'm telling you, you can intentionally do this. You can intentionally step into this realm. We just don't know it. We keep waiting for God to move us. All right. Amen. 
so anyway, there it is, interpreting. Again, 1 Corinthians 14, 12. Yeah, do I have that right? No, 22 and 23. Let me make sure I got this right. 12 and 13. That's not correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. Even so you, since, verse 12, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Always be interested in edifying the assembly. Therefore, how do you do that? How do you excel at edifying the church? Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue in a public meeting pray that he may interpret so that you learn to excel. Now, notice this. <clears throat> Even so you, as you are zealous for spiritual gifts, and I don't mean to be a negative person, so, you know, pray for me. But I'm not seeing many churches zealous for spiritual gifts. I'm just not seeing it. All right? Maybe if the circles you run around, they are, and praise God for that, but I think it needs to be a lot more. The gifts will only manifest to the degree that that church wants them to manifest. Okay? He, say, he says, since you're zealous for spiritual manifestations, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Notice it's you that seek to excel. It's not up to God to fall on you. It's not up to God to make it work. It's you seeking and learning and trial and error often, often trial and error that you're seeking to excel. So it's up to you whether you excel in this or not. And... Uh, Therefore, how do you seek to excel? Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue in a public meeting pray that he may also interpret. Y'all see that? We can, we can make our mind up. We're going to excel at this. Praise God. And God will give us the grace to do it. Verse 26 through 28 again, public meeting. How is it then, brothers, when you, whenever, whenever you come together? Whenever you come together. Each of you has a song. We could say a song. It has a teaching. Has a tongue. Has a revelation has an interpretation, let all things be done for edification. Now, I want to point something out to you because I won't cover this again, and it's something the Lord showed me about two years ago, uh, and I want, to, I want to verify it before I say this to you about Revelation. Um, verse, uh, let's see, verse, um, yeah, verse 6. Go Look at verse 6. Are you there? 1 Corinthians 14, 6. Yeah, we're still in 1 Corinthians 14. But now, brothers or sisters, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by, what's the first thing? Revelation. So the first byproduct of praying in tongues is you begin to have revelation in the Word. You begin to see things in the Word. Then you'll have revelation about words of knowledge about people. But notice the first byproduct is not interpretation, but revelation. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Now look at verse 26. How is it then, brothers, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue. Ooh, what's right after that? Has a revelation, then has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. So when these two verses come to side by side, the first byproduct of praying in tongues is greater revelation. Revelation. Andrew Womack says the more he prays in tongues, the more he sees. He also says that. John Lake said the same thing. All right? So just continue to pray, and, and the word will open up to you, uh, and you'll be benefited and blessed by it. All right, number four, tongues as an office or calling, much like pastor or prophet is called into the ministry. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 through 30. This is the one that most people get hung up on. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 27, you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. So, Allison, to answer your question, there's a difference between somebody who's appointed into these offices. So an apostle, he's going to have certain giftings, and different apostles will have different mixes. <clears throat> okay, you have some apostles that they're evangelistic. An apostle means somebody sent on a mission to a specific location to establish the kingdom of God. It's a sent one. So an, you, may, you may have an evangelistic apostle. You may have a prophet apostle. 
a prophetic apostle, okay? So they're going to have different gift mixes going on. But uh, that's not something you choose. That's something God chooses. But do you see he's talking about offices set in the church? Do you see the context? Right. Now, are all apostles? No. But are we all sent? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not as apostles. Are all prophets? No. But can everybody prophesy? Yes. yes. Are all teachers? No. Not in the office of teacher, but we can all teach the word. Right? Right? Are all workers of miracles? No, there are people called. That's their calling to work miracles. Right. That's what they're called to do. Right. But can we all work miracles as we yield? Yeah. Um, do all have gifts of healings? Right. No. But we can all operate in gifts of healings. But there are people that are called to that. Right. That's what they do. All right. Uh, do all speak with tongues? No, not as a ministry. But everybody can speak with tongues, but not all is called into the office. Do all interpret? Yeah, you can interpret. He said up there. Now, now think with me logically, because this is the, listen, listen guys, this is the one that gets everybody tripped up. Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? See right there. God doesn't want everybody speaking with tongues. Wait a minute. Can we think biblically for a minute? He's talking about ministry gifts. Right. Not your prayer language. How do I know that? Go back up here to verse uh, chapter 14. Hold your place in 1 Corinthians 12. Go back up here to chapter uh, 14. Verse 13. Therefore let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue... My spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So are you telling me that God only wants some people to be able to pray with their spirit and everybody else has to just depend on their thinking? So when you're praying in tongues, your spirit's praying. Right. Would God only want some people praying out of their spirit and others don't get to? <clears throat> are you thinking with me? But yet they'll go to 1 Corinthians 12, 27. And they'll say, see right there? Do all speak with tongues? No. So that's not my gift. God doesn't want everybody. Wait a minute. That's a ministry that's gift. A that's a calling. Because right here, he says, if you pray in a tongue, your spirit prays. Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody. Yep. Now let's just look at verse 17. For you indeed give thanks well. Well, does God only want some people giving thanks in the spirit? Nope. Nobody else is allowed to give thanks out of their spirit? He only picks some people to be able to pray in tongues and give thanks? The rest of us just have to use our mind? I don't think God's unjust like that. Right. You see, it takes the word to interpret the word. So again, the context, and I could go on and on. We could, mm -hmm. I could go on and on and, and prove to you. But back to 1 Corinthians 12, 27, uh, and that'll be the number one verse that many of your denominational people will go to. Do all speak with tongues? Or there is 1 Corinthians 12, 30. No, not as a ministry. Now, I can tell you right now, Rhea and I haven't yielded to it as we should, but we operate in the office of tongues and interpretation. And when we yield to it, choose to yield to it, right. it's a blessing. Right. All right? Uh, but he said, earnestly desire the best gifts. All right. Now, so that's a ministry or a calling. It's similar to, in your outline, this is similar to the prophet's ministry. Similar to a prophet's ministry. Number five, tongues as a sign to unbelievers that don't necessarily need Interpretation. You put, put the word necessarily there. All right. So uh, you all are familiar with Acts chapter two, verse four through eleven. I think we can. Can I have that five more minutes? Would that be all right? Acts chapter two. I don't want to wear you out. I know it's late. Acts chapter two, verse four through eleven. Um, this is the day of Pentecost. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. By the way, the Holy Ghost doesn't speak with tongues. You do. Very often, the number one hindrance to people being filled with the Spirit speaking with tongues, they're waiting for the Holy Ghost to make them do it. Yeah. It's up to your will mm. to yield to that. You, it's working with the will of the person to speak in syllables they don't know. Yeah. It's not the Holy Ghost trying to make them or move them or force them. It's He's giving them the utterance, but they take the first step. All right. And uh, so some think that it's going like to be the Holy Spirit going to be like come into them like a radio and he'll just start talking out of them. And it <laughs> takes over and they don't have anything to do with it, you know. 
you got to get that idea out of their head that he just kind of takes over. Right. The Holy Spirit, demons will take over. Holy Ghost doesn't. Right. You have to will to yield to it. Right. All right. That that lesson right there is the best way to help. Knowing what I just said to you, you're helping people to yield. Right. All right. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. So this was the Feast of Pentecost, and the Jews that lived in all these other nations had come to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. They came from different nations. And when this sound occurred, I guess they heard the wind or the tongues. I don't know which one. The multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, look, are these not all, all these who speak Galileans? Now, Galileans were known as uneducated men. Yep. They were not well-schooled. All right? So for them to hear their own language from their, their country, very fluently spoken from these uneducated fishermen, it was blowing their mind. Right. All right? Um, and then, you know, he lists all of it. He says, how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? He goes through all of them, all the way down to uh, verse 11. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So when we're praying in tongues, guess what we're doing? Many times we're praising him for his wonderful works. Glory to God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying, what could this mean? And Peter got up and explained it. So what happened is they were all these Galileans were praying in tongues, as Addison said last week. But by the time it got to the different ears, they heard it in their own native language. One guy said, they're speaking in French. He says, no, they're not. That's Greek. No, it's not. That's Italian. No, it's not. That's whatever. So here's what I'm trying to say. There are times that when you're speaking with tongues, God will cause that other person to hear it in their language. <clears throat> it's a miracle. But right. that's not the only use of it. Right. All right? Uh, and then 1 Corinthians 12, 20 through 25, talking about tongues as a sign for the unbeliever. You can look at that later. Uh, it's a sign for the unbeliever. I'm going to give you a couple examples. Uh, a missionary went to Mexico and was preaching a meeting in Mexico. And uh, he, he gave an invitation. This American missionary gave an invitation for some of the Mexican people to be filled, very poor village, to be filled with the Spirit. And so he's laying, hand, he's laying hands on these people. And one of the Mexican ladies just started praising God in perfect English. Fluent English, like glory to God, hallelujah, praise God, thank you, Jesus. And, and the, the missionary thought, wow, she's very fluent. So after the meeting, he said, I didn't know that this lady over here could speak English so well. He said, she can't. He said, she's a wash lady. She takes in washing. She's very poor. She's not even educated enough to speak Spanish, much less English. He said, so what are you telling me? She was speaking with tongues when you laid hands on her, and she happened to be speaking in English. She didn't know a word she was saying, but it was in perfect English. Another lady uh, in, the, yeah, in the United States. Isn't that awesome? Uh, she was speaking in a rare, perfect Chinese dialect that is only known in a very small region in China. And so they're in here, over here in America, and she starts speaking with tongues in this strange dialect, and then the congregation got quiet, <clears throat> waiting for the interpretation. No one interpreted. So they thought, the pastor thought, well, we've missed God here. We need to interpret. And so he said, um, we need to interpret that. Well, finally, the person in front of that lady, another uneducated lady, was speaking in this language, said, you, you don't need to interpret that. I'm a missionary. I've been running from the call of God. I've been rebelling against the call of God. I was a missionary to a very rare region in China. And the only place in China that this ancient dialect is spoken, she was speaking it, and I understood every word she said. The Lord said, you need to get back on track. I have great blessing for you. You need to go back to where I called you to because it's not going to work out for you otherwise. It's good. From an uneducated lady. It didn't need to be interpreted. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. Well, those weren't signs to an unbeliever, but they were certainly not needing to be interpreted. Right. Okay. And then, uh, then last of all, tongues in a public prayer or worship meeting do not necessarily have to be interpreted. Acts 2, 4, day of Pentecost, they spoke with tongues. Nobody interpreted. Didn't need to be. In Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 46, when Peter was preaching to the Italian group, 
They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Nobody interpreted because it was a corporate meeting of prayer. Okay, same things in Act 19.6. Paul laid hands on the 12. They spoke with tongues and prophesied. They didn't interpret. And then you can read Acts 4.23 through 31 where they were having a prayer meeting and the Holy Spirit told you what they prayed, but they couldn't have all possibly been praying that word for word. In Acts 4, the, the Luke was interpreting what was being prayed corporately in tongues in that prayer. And the place was shaken and moved by the power of God. So when we're having certain believers meetings, a prayer meeting in here, or having a prayer meeting where it's not open just to the public, uh, it's okay to pray in tongues together. It's okay to pray in the Spirit for 45 minutes to an hour. Just pray and worship and then interpret as we need to. And if for somebody that's not familiar with it, we're going to walk in love and interpret stuff. Right. But if we're here together in a home meeting or in a, proper, a, a prayer meeting, and it's us in here, we just need to pray. We just need to pray and worship in tongues and get some things done. Amen. Amen. All right, it's 26. I'm six minutes past. Now, I want you everybody to stand up. And that's you got the bonus on the back. Praise God. We're just going to pray for about four minutes. We'll, I'll get you out of here at 830. All right? Let's just pray in the Holy Ghost. You can walk and pray. You can kneel and pray. But we're going to have you pray for, it's 827, so for two and a half minutes, let's just pray in the Spirit. Father, we're just going to yield to the Holy Ghost. Whatever needs to be prayed, whatever immediately you know needs to be prayed, we yield to you and trust you to use us to get it done in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, ha ha. Oh, glabe jebi tavare ambo krabs in zidebi. Ha, shede la dana do umbro gede dasa. Yane no mani vela so krava shele brevi. Ha, sinanana o ol karabi sebri. Jebro vo respere kat sana ketele stuko tele repesi dig dag za do ungo de debi de kash kananola nanana de veche de ata. Ha, yeta ma yelo bro bo se brevi san zelanza. Yam brasta fele de ze frugo baza vijinaga zombo ele rixen da teken zota jada. Zelavana bo se rebe de faseke de 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 no vanana ma salava de stinkel zota jete de de bala. Yen no brame de visa so brame de visho brame de so brame de se no bro de face de rebe de salava. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah, Mate le grobo. Jean J. K. le grobo zagrada de vice vera. A la bote, a lepra, a lepra, a lepra, a lepra, a lepra, a lepra, sabredi. A ripa, a setepo o sapre, et sepa a dobo sapre, et se bredes de levres et zidmarevai. Je chatela, detska da bota, et e vredi ze brogo brazadzana, melan broba, ze gilen grazo do de deba na sota je dega. Hallelujah, Lord. Koramana sobre de lishtela. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Groste. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Glory, glory, glory. Etamana. Sida. Et Salenda. Glory, 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 glory. We bless you. Hallelujah. 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 I hear that. I hear that, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. 
praise you, Lord. Glory. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Glory. Hallelujah. Miracle, miracle, miracle in the making. Miracles in the making. Miracles in the making. As you yield to the Lord. I feel like you're saying this. As you yield to the Spirit. As you exercise a vocal miracle. You begin to produce miracles in the making. Making miracles. Making miracles as you pray in the Spirit. Praise God. Praise God. Glory to God. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of this time on Monday night to hear the word. Help us, Lord, to lead in this area of the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Help us, help us, help us. And we thank you that you are. I know I'm asking you to do what you're already going to do. But thank you for your help. I'll let me put it that way. Thank you for the help. I just changed that, Lord. Thank you for the help. Glory to God. We're yielding to it. In Jesus' name, glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right.